This session primarily looks at the Indo-Pacific. There was a lot of talk about the Indo-Pacific uh, in the first session, in the inaugural session. We heard uh, all the speakers talking about how Indo-Pacific has brought uh, Spain and India together, this idea, this concept, this emerging strategic geography and what it means uh, for our priorities and, and what it means for the larger global order. We, have, we heard uh, from different speakers uh, in the inaugural session. And now we want to take the conversation forward in terms of some specifics uh, as to why this uh, nomenclature matters, why this strategic geography matters, uh, and what Spain and India together can do uh, with regard to this, this specific geography. And I, and I have um, a very distinguished set of people around me to talk about that. I'll, um, I'll let you figure out who they are. Um, but And on behalf of the panel, thanks um, uh, uh, to the organizers, I was told that we will not be thanking anyone. Not 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 all the pan everyone would be involved in, in giving formal thanks. Uh, so we jump straight to uh, uh, to uh, Elena uh, Gomez Castro, who is special ambassador for the Indo-Pacific Spanish government. Uh, she, uh, I think it would be very useful, Elena, to hear from you. Uh, Spain's vision for the Indo-Pacific. How does Spain think about this geography? Uh, I think countries and nations are still struggling and grappling with exactly what it means. How do you conceptualize it? But what specifically it means for Spanish foreign policy? So over to you. Thank you very much, Vice President, for having us today here and for organizing all this. I would say, first, uh, the greater context uh, on which we are all operating, which is marked by three dynamics, so political, from rules to power, that was mentioned by the President. The second, on economy, from efficiency to resilience or security, which is paramount. And the third one, our societies, from progress to uncertainty and to frustration. And those are the three dynamics we have to work with. Uh, Europe and Asia, in the second place, are no longer separate strategic theatres. In the Pacific has become a decisive region for the world's future, as it was mentioned before. And the Indian Ocean is a gateway for Europe into the Indo-Pacific, <coughs> but also vice versa, because in the Indian Ocean is where all coincide. It's a crossroads, but also a meeting point. <coughs> we have shared concerns and are confronted to similar, not necessarily the same uh, way, risks and challenges, and our futures are linked, <coughs> inseparable, as it was mentioned by Jaipal in the presentation. In the case of India, we have common interests, we also value and we dwell on both to, um, to broaden and deepen our cooperation. Now my third point is new world, new formulas. I mean, there's a, a huge risk now to try and uh, reinvent the wheel. So we have to be really careful about <coughs> not throwing uh, the baby with the bath water. We need to fine tune, we need to adapt certainly, and especially we have to focus on the societies. That's why Spain, um, in this attempt to co-design what will be the future is organizing the fourth international conference on financing for development in Seville on the 30th of June. That will be paramount for the third great challenge, which is societies. And finally, the process has to be inclusive. We have seen it today, civil society, companies, and people to people. And we have an, to have a new way of working together, supporting supporters. That's a very flexible concept. There will be times when one will need to be supported by the other and vice versa. For that, you need a common understanding, but also to create a level playing field and trust. And that is precisely what we are all doing here today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And, and I will take the conversation forward with Ambassador Bambavale. Uh, Ambassador, uh, when, you, when we look at this from Indian perspective, I think some of the themes are strikingly similar, open, free, uh, inclusive, prosperous, uh, secure in Indo-Pacific. Uh, what makes it so germane to India's requirements that countries like Spain are joining uh, you know, with like-minded partners and ensuring that these principles are preserved? No, absolutely. Harsh, uh, as you rightly summarized, India's approach to the Indo-Pacific is not merely that it should be free and open, but it should also uh, work towards prosperity. And uh, last but not least, it should be inclusive. So India's idea of the Indo-Pacific is not targeting any one country. <clears throat> However, India does uh, look at uh, what's happening in the Indo-Pacific, and there can be very little doubt that there is one country, and people in government may not want to mention it, but I have to, I have to mention it. There's, there's one country in this geography, namely China, which is trying to work towards multipolarity at the global level, but is also trying to strive for unipolarity in Asia. 
And therefore, all of this free, open, inclusive, etc., is something that uh, we need to guard against. And all of us, the international <coughs> community, needs to work together to ensure that China does not, um, you know, break this rule of law that exists in uh, the <coughs> Indo-Pacific. And I think uh, it's important for Spain also to be part of that to the extent they can, given their capabilities and capacities. Uh, I would suggest strongly, and uh, perhaps uh, Madam can take this back home to Madrid, that Spain should look at working with India in the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative that India has suggested. So those are some of my ideas. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And, and perhaps we'll, we'll come back to, uh, to specifics on in, uh, uh, Indian Ocean, uh, uh, Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative uh, later. But let me turn to uh, Juan Carlos, uh, uh, who was, I think, former director um, of uh, General for Asia and the Pacific. So, and he has been part of this a conversation for a very long time. He has seen Spain-India relationship grow. And I think this whole idea of, of how Asia is changing and, and what is uh, how we are looking at this vast maritime space through a different lens together. So I would like him to talk about his journey, uh, both as a practitioner and now looking at it from the outside, as to what, what has transformed in the last decade or decade and a half and what exactly it means for this conversation. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for this idea. Uh, there is a very well-known Spanish lawyer. He's not only a very good Spanish lawyer, but he's also a very good thinker and a lover of uh, Asia, Antonio Garrigues. And he used to say that Spain for centuries have had a stiff neck, historical stiff neck. Uh, we have been looking always towards West. And uh, this is the time to look East. 20 years ago, um, the relations between India and Spain were good, but uh, with the lack of content. I would like to, to remind just very briefly to see where we were and to see where we are now and what, can, what we can we do to, together in the next future. 20 years ago, uh, Spain had a very small embassy in, in New Delhi, and that was all. <clears throat> Grow, uh, in, in, in some years, we managed to, to uh, foster that embassy to become what it is now, open a consulate general in Mumbai, open a commercial office in Mumbai, open a Cervantes Institute in, in New Delhi, organize the first historical visit of President of India to Spain, the first in history <clears throat> in 2009, President Patil. We include India as a strategy for Spain, as a, strategy, a strategic country for, for the foreign policy of Spain. We created the foundation, Spain-India Council Foundation. In brief, we put the basis to have had the photograph we have today with the Prime Minister of Spain inaugurating this forum. This means a lot. Not, not only for, to the foundation, which is the, the last important, but this means a lot for Spain and, and, and for Europe. It is true that uh, despite considerable geographic uh, distance and um, different figures, we are countries with uh, different dimensions. It is true that uh, beyond that uh, fact, the potential is excellent. We are regional influential powers, each, each of us in our respective regions. And the potential for doing things and for doing things together, as it, it has been stated uh, this morning, is enormous and uh, we are ready to do it. Thank you, Juan. Uh, uh, Shivali, uh, you have been a long time observer of uh, uh, India-Europe relationship. And I think this is India-Spain relationship uh, is also nested in that wider India-Europe relationship. And that has been very transformative in the last few years. Uh, how do you, when you look at, uh, you know, where uh, Juan laid out the, the arc of this relationship changing over the last uh, decade, two decades, uh, how do you look at that transformation, both from a bilateral perspective, but also from a broader uh, India-Europe perspective? Because this, this a lot of the conversations that we are having with Spain are also nested in that larger India-Europe conversation. 
Um, I think I would like to start, since we're talking about the Indo-Pacific, I would like to um, bring into the conversation the EU's Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, that is a very robust one. And in fact, um, I think India and the EU are working together. Um, we have our own saga that Prime Minister Modi has very well uh, you know, laid out. And I think uh, picking up from uh, what Ambassador Bambavale said about it being inclusive, and I think the Prime Minister has laid a lot of emphasis <coughs> on that, the Indian Prime Minister. So I see a lot of synergies between um, Sagar as well as uh, the EU uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. Now within the larger EU Indo-Pacific strategy, of course there are a few countries like France and Germany and the Netherlands, but I think Spain is very quickly catching up with that. The fact that Madam is here and uh, you know, the ambassador uh, to or for the Indo-Pacific is, um, is a telling sign. Um, that said, uh, <coughs> You know, they also have the FCAS, the, the Future um, Aircraft Combat uh, System. And uh, France, Germany and Spain, in fact, are part of that trilateral. They carried out joint exercises in the Indo-Pacific, particularly in the Indian Ocean, if I'm not mistaken, madam. And that itself is a telling sign that Spain is very quickly catching up with that lag and playing a very active role within the larger European Indo-Pacific strategy. I would also like to add here, Professor Pons, that um, Crimarion, the you know, Operation Atlanta, the headquarters have shifted to Spain. In fact, after Brexit, Rota is now the headquarters of, um, of Operation Atlanta. So these are a few, I would say, very telling signs of uh, the robust role that Spain will play within the larger Indo-Pacific strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, uh, Vice Admiral Luthra, uh, a lot of this conversation is around, of course, uh, uh, Indo-Pacific is a maritime space and uh, therefore a lot of the debate and discussion is about what does it mean uh, from a maritime perspective, uh, but also what it means from a larger security perspective. So if you can elaborate some of the choices uh, that I think like-minded yeah. partners can make in this with India and what are the challenges there which we should be cognizant of? Well, uh, first, let me say that the entire concept of Indo-Pacific, when it started in 2016, around there, thereabouts, it was initially mainly maritime and on freedom of navigation and things like that. But gradually, the agenda in the Indo-Pacific construct has become multidimensional and much broad-based now. And that is reflected, as uh, was mentioned, in the EU's... Uh, and EU's uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, I think, of all the Indo-Pacific strategies that are out there, it is the most comprehensive Indo-Pacific strategy with an action agenda, which is reviewed regularly. So uh, from that point of view, and Spain is a strong supporter of the uh, action agenda, also the EU-India roadmap, which has been uh, worked out and which has specific uh, uh, issues related to maritime security. Now, uh, security as, as a whole uh, in the Indo-Pacific, as we all know, it, it, it's a very turbulent uh, uh, period that we are watching with conflicts and with all types of challenges, whether it is traditional and the, the uh, divide between traditional and non-traditional threats to security has blurred, it's all got merged. There is a broader, much broader view of security, uh, both by Spain and by India. And uh, Spain has, of course, now recently published its uh, uh, strategy for national strategy for maritime security in 2024, which includes the uh, Indian Ocean in its areas of interest. But what we are witnessing in the Indo-Pacific is uh, at, the, at one level, there is deterrence and de-risking that is going on. At the other level, there are partnerships and engagement going on. This is the uh, reality in uh, the Indian Ocean and specifically as far as India is concerned, mention was made of Sagar, mention was made of IPOI. But if you look at the entire approach, which is also to a large extent demonstrated by India's uh, participation in the Quad, that India's overall approach to security or the overall approach to the Indo-Pacific region could be termed as, I would term it as development linked cooperative security. It's development-linked cooperative security, as India has always been opposed to collective alliances, etc. So it's 
and therefore and ipoi also maritime security is the first pillar of ipoi there are six other pillars which deal with resources with ecology with development with maritime transport with different and finally my last point is that both spain and india of course technology digitalization many other areas that have been spoken of today but both india and spain as traditional maritime powers are now working strongly to revive their maritime sector even outside the security space india has a maritime india vision 2030 maritime india amrit kal vision 2047 where all whether it is ports terminals logistics uh, coastal communities fisheries ship building ship recycling all areas related to ship building and uh, the shipping sector in india in the next 5 years i can i can say that we will see a major boost in this sector which is uh, on the horizon and so is spain looking at this sector including using uh, climate friendly technologies in the shipping sector mm -hmm. along with other sectors so i i think both in the maritime domain and in the security domain where we are spain and india have started exercising together only recently the navies have started exercising including in the gulf of guinea we've uh, had exercise of course in the western indian ocean which is a important area from op atlanta was uh, mentioned and subsequently the operation spice with their india has had its own operation alongside prosperity guardian of the uh, eu india's operation sankalp has been going on there after the increase in violence in the western indian ocean so uh, the two navies have started cooperating there is a larger swath but there is so much more uh, that can be done together and uh, i i think uh, ipoi maybe we can talk later but i think it it's a good idea for spain to consider being part of ipoi because three european nations are already part of ipoi that is uh, france italy and germany you can choose the pillar that you want to be uh, participating in and greece is considering it right now but uh, it it could be a good way to uh, take this uh, partnership forward Uh, thank you, and I think if one can shamelessly plug ORF, uh, ORF's work, we are hosting uh, a, a, you know a conference on uh, Sagar Manthan next next month in Delhi, uh, which which would be which would be talking about a lot of things that that Admiral Luthra was uh, talking about. So clearly, I think that area which which you highlighted uh, as far as the maritime space is concerned. and uh, that is going to be uh, really the focal point of attention from various perspectives uh, ambassador one can uh, if one can come back to you uh, if you can highlight uh, i think the india spain partnership bit on this now that you have uh, had time in the, in this position and you have had uh, had a look as to how the rapidly that the dynamic is changing what are the areas where you think uh, one can collaborate in the immediate future and also perhaps and uh, then one can take a very long term view of the relationship uh, developing over a period of time of course thank you very much well first it was mentioned about uh, the uh, in the pacific strategy having it or not having it uh, spain has had a uh, asia plans asia strategy since 2004 so uh, if we decided not to do another one when we had the european union one is what because we saw that everything we wanted to see in that strategy was in that strategy and we worked very hard so perhaps i can talk about about words and deeds because they are both equally important uh, what we say and what we do and when we look at the uh, in the pacific strategy of the european union the 2021 there's no confusion about what this is all about first it's a title cooperation and then when you see uh, what said the key words engagement partnerships rules based order The aim is to lay the foundations for a long-term prosperity and a mutually beneficial relationship. I think uh, the basis is is very very clear and the aims too. And how has it worked? So that that gets us to the deeds. Uh, let me just focus perhaps on on three <coughs> things. The first is the main instrument has been the global gateway. That is a game changer. Now we are mid run, so. the the first trial run of that uh, of that initiative is still ongoing we will have council conclusions uh, in a few weeks and spain is striving to see in those council conclusions what we want to see first ownership second demand driven from the projects third added value which means quality over quantity third focus on the triple transition first social first and of course then digital and green but without the social one it will be very difficult to get to the other two and then of course sdgs 
as the goal and sustainability. So that's our, those are the words and those are the concepts that we are trying to plug in and to make sure that they are there. Um, on security, the global commons are, are shared responsibilities. And we have to be honest about that. It's not the West and the rest. No, it's all of us together. How we do it, it depends, the added value. We are middle-sized power. We spoke about maritime security. Of course, we cannot be everywhere. We're, we are in our neighborhood. We are focusing also in the Gulf of Guinea, and especially in the mission of missions that we considered to be Atalanta. It was launched uh, by France and Spain back in December 2008, and we have been in the lead of that operation ever since. We are the only country that has contributed on a permanent basis with naval and air assets. And we consider it first a support to multilateralism. Remember that it was the World Food Programme was the main task of this operation. So there, I think, is the, the main point. And second, we're doing cooperative security uh, with uh, the neighboring countries, but also with uh, the Asian countries that are present in the area. It's the meeting point. It's the crossroads I referred to before. We're doing exercises at the Amur just uh, mentioned, and we're building trust, confidence, not only amongst us, but also with the rest of the international community that is there. We have signed agreements with Japan, with Korea, or with Oman, with Atalanta. So I think that's a real added value. Uh, probably we will not go that often to the uh, further, uh, to the uh, China Sea, etc. But let's concentrate and let's make sure that wherever we coincide, we do our best. And I think we are doing it for the, for the time being. And then my last point is on dialogue. Uh, we need to understand each other. The fact that the European Union has also a security dialogue and actually took place before the Schuman Forum in May yeah. underscored very much the importance we attach to those global commons because we discussed about maritime security. It was discussed also uh, about cyber, but also space. So I yeah. think uh, we have lots of venues uh, to continue working on that. And then finally, for the future, um, the new president or the president of the commission that will uh, repeat uh, in the uh, political guidelines, he said, first, <laughs> building on the existing strategy. So the strategy of the European Union is there to stay with certain fine tunings. We will deepen our engagement with our partners in the region. We will propose a new strategic EU-India agenda. We have the summit uh, pending. And then the second point is what the president said, the president of Spain said, uh, that we will have a now, time is ripe, I think, to underscore or to showcase our own approach to Asia. So we will have a new strategy. So both the summit at the European Union level, the new strategic agenda and our own strategy, I think brings about new opportunities to be able to deliver at the speed of relevance. Thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador Bambavle, you you mentioned in your in your uh, remarks, uh, you know, certain actors you that are problematic. China, uh, of course, has certain view of the region, uh, but there is also this broader challenge in the Indo-Pacific, which is about uh, over dependence or uh, trading relationships, which are not sustainable. Uh, how uh, when you when you sort of balance how, the strategic dimension versus the economic dimension. Uh, how do you see uh, countries and countries which are like-minded, perhaps, and which want to uh, push back on certain areas? How do you then balance your strategic requirements with the kind of economic relationships that we have had for a while now? Uh, and particularly, I think, with regard to China, how do we start reconceptualizing this, this notion of over-dependence? Uh, because that's a conversation that I think all of us are having and yeah. um, uh, we seem to be having since 2020. Uh, so. And we have not progressed much. There have been some challenges there. So how do we start thinking about that? Because that would be a very important part of how do like-minded countries get together and think about these, these important, this important issue. Yeah, that's an excellent question, really. And I think different countries respond differently because they have to uh, gauge it for the, from their own national interest perspective. Uh, so if you look at a country like, say, Indonesia, which is part of ASEAN, um, Indonesia seems to have been able to balance its economic relationship with, say, a country like China. Uh, but also they have uh, protected and promoted their uh, security interests. So I think each country has to do it on its own. Um, if you were asking about India, because you spoke about 2020, I believe that, you know, we already have in place, uh, 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 you know, press note three, which says that any Chinese investment into India 
has to be judged on a case by case basis and that we will uh, balance out the economic interest with the security interest. So a national security perspective has been brought in uh, over the past few years and we should continue to do that. Um, in fact, I have uh, suggested and written that if we don't have the government organizations uh, which are required for this uh, in place, then we need to put them in place now because this is something which is going to be important for all countries in the region, in the Indo-Pacific as we go forward and particularly for India where we have a strong security um, interest as well as an economic <coughs> interest. So one, if, if, if one can you know, touch upon this larger issue of, of economic uh, structures in the Indo-Pacific, uh, we are having a big debate, serious debate about supply chain resilience, uh, how the trading architecture is being created and then being recreated. Uh, from, a, from, a, from, from your perspective, European or Spanish perspective, how do you look at the, uh, the, the, the Indo-Pacific as the center of gravity of global uh, economics? Because that's, that's something clearly which is very important part of this engagement with, with the region and, and with India in particular. Of course, um, we had also, let me start again with a, with a quote. We had a, a former minister of foreign affairs, Josep Piquet, who passed away recently, who used to say that the center of the world had shifted from, from the Atlantic to the, to the Strait of Malacca. He, he used to say that the Strait of Malacca was now exactly the center of the economic and the political, political world. Of course, Indian Ocean carries the world the, the name of India. And India is paramount to the to the India Pacific uh, in Indo-Pacific strategy. In recent years, it is true that the the risk matrices for for business have uh, shifted and has um, <coughs> uh, significant changes. First uh, first order threats for uh, security and stability were not even among the, for the company's top priorities in the very recent years. Geopolitical risks are one of the most uh, challenging threats that the companies we suffer today because they are unpredictable and uh, they are widespread. Uh, for instance, the Ukraine war or the Gaza war, which are conflicts uh, away from the from the Indian India Indo-Pacific <coughs> region, have a direct impact in stability, in supply chain chains, in energy, in in the region, and outside the, outside the region. Uh, the profoundest uh, aspects of all these risks have uh, immediate consequences on our businesses. And therefore, we have to uh, redraft our own strategies to face this, these challenges. We have passed a, a time where uh, just in time is not enough. Now we have to, to think in just in case. And just in case means to, to advance our, our strategies uh, to, towards uh, prevention of this of this of the consequences of this of these uh, risks disruptions in, in global trade are um, are obvious the admiral have uh, enumerated some of them i would like to to focus just with enumeration on on the maritime transportation of course but also on the world trade on energy security and on reliability so Shivali, uh, you know, we have uh, talked about China's uh, and, 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 and the economic relationship with China. And we have talked about how geopolitical uh, aspects are becoming so critical variables in our economic thinking. Uh, but here, uh, if you think of the India-EU FTA, for example, it, it has been stuck for a long time. There is some degree of optimism about it that it may just happen given that the geopolitical heft is now being uh, is there and the argument is being made that this is important not only for economic reasons but also for larger reasons um, which which are which are self evident uh, do you first of all do you see that happening uh, and do you do you really see this geo geopolitical argument becoming a driver uh, for the 
changing economic relationship with Europe? I think so, because I think it's, it's evident that um, we've had a spate of visits to India. Um, the Spanish uh, Prime Minister um, was here. Uh, signing so many deals. Um, then we had the German Chancellor's visit. Um, and of course, the summit just might happen. Um, I truly believe that India has a very, very significant role to play. And therefore, the FTA between India and EU could just become a reality very soon. Um, I think it's, it's very crucial, um, India's role in all of this. And when you talk about, um, you know, uh, the, the shift, the focus. India therefore plays a very important role. I think it's one of the stable areas in the globe today uh, with a vibrant economy and a very, very good talent pool, particularly our young people. The demographic dividend is, I think, our strength as well as our talent pool. Um, I, you know, just before we started the session, I was having this conversation with our, uh, our Spanish, one of us, one of your colleagues, and what she had to say was, uh, the Spanish are looking for Indian talent. So I think going forward, it's going to be a win-win situation for both sides, both bilaterally, that is at the national level, but also the EU as a bloc. And therefore, to answer your question, Professor, I think that the the FDA could just become a reality. Okay, that's very optimistic. <laughs> yes, uh, but uh, certainly. Um, I think if, if, there, if there was ever a moment, I think it is this, uh, it, to, to make that argument. Um, uh, Admiral Luthra, just, uh, you know, when you, when you look at the maritime space and you covered a lot of, lot of the issues, uh, where are three or four things that we, you know, what are the three or four things where you see potential, particularly with, with countries like Spain, uh, when, when it comes to the maritime domain? Because there are a lot of things but you don't want to do a lot of things, you want to prioritize, so where would you prioritize it? Well, uh, prioritization, India, Spain, I mentioned earlier about IPOI, uh, but trade is, uh, trade and connectivity is one part, uh, where we could, the India, uh, Middle East, Europe economic corridor, uh, that uh, has moved a little slowly because of the disruptions in the Middle East, but, that is one area, again, uh, we, we are working with Greece, Italy, etc. but uh, Spain, given its location as tried trade routes and India's location as tried trade routes. So I think trade is one area. Since you talked about trade, let me also, uh, uh, and, uh, a mention was made about my, both Spain and India, huge dependence, maritime trade. India particularly, you see, 95% of our trade by volume and 70% by value is by the sea. 26% of our GDP is from the maritime uh, trade sector and both India and Spain are energy dependent, including hydrocarbons. And India's dependence on the seas, while that is not the import dependence, I'm talking about dependence on the seas, including our own uh, sort of uh, exploration and production. Our dependence on the seas for energy is 95% and our imports are above 80%. So therefore, the other sector that uh, India and, uh, and uh, green hydrogen is something that India and uh, which is linked to the maritime sector as well because it's all going to come up close to the ports. And uh, so therefore, uh, green and Spain is working hard on uh, green uh, hydrogen sector. So I think uh, and India has a green hydrogen mission this is one area I think that should be uh, uh, taken up. Green hydrogen is one. Uh, maritime security wise, our cooperation, which is already uh, uh, progressing in the Western Indian Ocean is one. IPOI pillars working together is uh, another one. And in the larger shipbuilding arena, uh, because Spain has expertise in shipbuilding and submarine building and commercial shipbuilding, India, India is building up that capacity. Mind you, uh, globally, Today, 56 or 57 percent of the shipbuilding capacity is with China, 30 percent is with South Korea, and 6 to 7 percent is with Japan. So, between these three countries, the shipbuilding capacity is about 95 to 96 percent. The rest, 3 to 4 percent of shipbuilding capacity is divided around the world. And this is shipbuilding capacity by tonnage. India is less than 1 percent, so is Europe. 
So Europe is now recognizing this, that they've lost this capacity and is trying to rebuild. And this is one area. Shipbuilding is another area that uh, uh, we could work on. And my final point is on, uh, since you uh, talked about bal economic balancing and uh, security and economic balancing in the first part, uh, and, and that's a debate going on in India and so also in uh, because Spain's dependence on China vis-a-vis -vis other European countries is different. In fact, in some ways it is lesser. And uh, so uh, while Spain also pursues uh, the European model of, uh, you know, uh, partner, competitor, rival, mm -hmm. these three, as the EU puts it. So but it's, it's a very simple way of putting it, partner, competitor, rival. It all depends upon how much emphasis you put in each of these sectors. What is more important for you, partner, competitor, or rival? And how much, and India's case is very different from Spain's case as far as this is concerned, this issue is concerned. And uh, Ambassador Bambavale made a sort of reference to this. In our case, it's, it's a different story. But opening up, yes, when the uh, value chains are moving, from supply chain efficiency to supply chain security. In this, or supply chain management, and therefore uh, driving the economic uh, uh, value as far as relationship with China is concerned, I think, again, uh, many op opportunities that we can work together. I think it's been, um, and, and I would like to close here because we have to move to the, to the second session. But it has been a remarkable conversation just to hear things about Spain-India relationship that one would not be talking about uh, a decade back. So I think the remarkable transformation uh, in the relationship, the remarkable changes uh, around the world, and I think the changes both within India and in Spain uh, are a testament to the fact that we are in, in a territory where a lot of these opportunities can be converted into something uh, on the ground. So with that, I would like to thank my panelists and uh, please join me in giving them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.